I was at Costco getting gas. The guy across from me had a tattoo that caught my eye. It was ancient Greek, Malone la Bet. And suddenly, the meaning of a famous saying of Jesus in the New Testament became clear in my mind. This kind of thing happens to me. It's why I go to Costco. I interrupted the tattooed man. Sir, sir? He turned with a mixture of curiosity and annoyance. Uh, I write about Greek. Can I take a picture of your tattoo? His look changed into a smile. This is one he had apparently not heard before. He raised his arm proudly, and I snapped this picture. You've probably seen Malone La Bad before on a bumper sticker, probably on a pickup truck featuring gun racks, if I may be permitted one stereotype. It's an NRA-style rallying cry, one in fact echoed by Charlton Heston in his own famous update of the phrase. The phrase comes from the words that Spartan King Leonidas used to respond to the invading Persian King Xerxes in 480 BC. Xerxes demanded that Leonidas surrender his weapons, and Leonidas replied, Come and take them. But if certain expository preachers got hold of this phrase, they would hasten to clarify it, like so. The first word is a participle, so literally what Leonidas said was, coming, or having come, take. That is all true. You're right, certain expository preachers. Wikipedia's article on this famous phrase says the very same thing, and it sounds exactly like some commentaries I have read and not a few sermons I have heard. The first word, malone, having come, is the aorist active participle, masculine nominative singular of the Greek verb blosko, to come. The aorist stem is mal, the present stem in blow, being a regular contraction of blow from a verbal root reconstructed as too tough to explain, but to appear. The aorist participle is used in cases where an action has been completed, also called the perfective aspect. This is a nuance indicating that the first action, the coming, must precede the second, the taking. This is where the saying of Jesus comes in. You see, when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, 19, he uses a similar construction, aorist participle plus imperative finite verb. Parufentes un mathetusete. Now, dear expository preachers, I love you, and I am one of you, but this kind of thing is your linguistic downfall, your homiletical siren song, your exegesis enhancing steroid that has been banned by Olsha, the original language's safely handled administration. Because this is what you want to say. I know you. You want to say, Jesus uses a Greek participle here, which literally means having gone. This means he assumes his hearers are going out to spread the gospel. It's like the going is assumed, and once you've gone, then you need to make disciples. But that's where Malone La Belle helps us. Because it's not Bible, we're less inclined to read extra meaning into it, meaning that goes underneath and beyond the English translation we already have in our hands. Malone La Belle means, it has to mean, given the context, only one thing. Come and take them. There's just no way that Leonidas, in that moment of stress, in that moment when he is called upon to be the macho trash talker, insolently defying the massive opposing army, said something as frilly and hair-splitting as, Dear Xerxes, once you have come, take. Malone Labe provides some evidence that participle plus imperative was just the ancient Greek way of saying stuff. Good idiomatic Greek that sounds like the Greek of native speakers often went participle plus imperative, in situations in which good idiomatic English that sounds like the English of native speakers would never ever do this. Having come take is not an accurate translation of Malone La Bé. It belongs buried deep in the niceties of a grammar book that no self-respecting Spartan warrior would ever touch, because he uses it in Lagos, of course, he wouldn't have to touch it. Jesus then did not say, having gone make disciples, he said, go and make disciples. Now, I have to acknowledge that Leonidas would have written his famous words five whole centuries before Christ, though they are reported to us by Plutarch in the first century, and that the word for come that he uses, blosko, does not appear in the New Testament. Little Scott Jones suggests that it dropped out of the language around the time of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in which it also does not appear. Similarly, what counted as good idiomatic Greek surely changed between the death of Leonidas and the birth of Jesus. But I observe the same participle plus imperative pattern in the New Testament. Using the Morph Search tab in Logos Bible software, I looked for places where imperatives follow participles. I decided to cast a very wide net by looking for any time one of those forms appeared near the other. The second hit I got is similar to Jesus' wording in the Great Commission. It's Herod sending the wise men to look for baby Jesus, and it's participle plus imperative. Go and search diligently for the child, Matthew 2, 8. 
Here's another from just 12 verses later, and it uses the same root as Malon Labet. Rise, take the child and his mother, Matthew 2.20. English speakers would just never say in these contexts, going, search for the child, or rising, take the child. That would be like saying, and this one was suggested by my wife who got better grades in Greek than I did, sitting down, eat your dinner. It is right for translators to do in these places what they nearly always do and change the participles into English imperatives. They aren't being overly interpretive. They are doing their job. They are translating from Greek into English. Rising, take the child, is not English because no one would ever say that. It's biblish, a linguistic surd, zombie syllables. And Tyndale did not die to give us biblish because it goes by a more common name gibberish. When expository preachers like myself make a point of saying what X passage really means is, and they then give their hearers biblish, they are erecting a linguistic barrier to understanding that is unnecessary at best and misleading at worst. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 says that edification requires intelligibility. He even expects quote, outsiders and unbelievers, verse 23 of that chapter, to be able to basically understand what they hear in church. Almost every time I hear in the Greek, this literally means I cringe. Now, there are places where the context indicates that the Greek idiom of participle plus imperative shouldn't be rendered as two imperatives in English. Here's one. When you fast, wash your head. Matthew 6.17. In this case, context shows that the best translation into English would not involve turning both these verbs into imperatives. So I'm not setting up a new grammar rule in which participle plus imperative in New Testament Greek must always become imperative plus imperative in English. I'm trying in my small way for the eternal honor of King Leonidas and of some guy at Costco to restore context to its rightful rule over grammar. A practical suggestion here. Before you take a grammar book's word for something, and before you go repeating a footnote in a commentary in your sermon, use Logos to check up on their work. Check newer commentaries who might interact with this claim. Sure, do that. And after writing this piece, I did check a few, and Carson says the same thing I do, but includes no pictures of tattoos, so mine is better. But then go the extra mile. Look at similar constructions and see if their conclusions work elsewhere. If they do, the writers you've read are probably describing something that is really happening in the language. If not, they're possibly finding more meaning than God put there, a common temptation for certain expository preachers. I need to end with a public threat. If someone says to me, surrender your linguistic observations from daily life that shed light on New Testament interpretation, there are too many of them, I will beat my chest and say, Malone love there.